It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Ken Zeichner. And Dr. Zeichner is the Boeing Professor of Teacher Education and the Director of Teacher Education at the University of Washington in Seattle. Before joining the University of Washington, he um, was in the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin in Madison for 33 years, where he was the Hoffs Bascom. How did I do? Okay. Uh, professor of Teacher Education in the Department of CNI, Curriculum and Instruction. He has served as the Vice President of AERA Division K, uh, as a member, uh, has been a member of the Board of Directors for AACTE, the American Association of Colleges uh, for Teacher Education, and co-chair of the AERA Panel on Research in Teacher Education. In 2009, he was elected to the National Academy of Education. His research focuses on understanding the historical trajectories of different approaches to improving teacher education and on elaborating the underlying assumptions, program elements, and consequences of different approaches to social justice-oriented teacher education. His recent publications include a book titled Teacher Education and the Struggle for Social Justice, published by Rutledge about three years ago. And this is a great article title, an article titled Competition, Economic Rationalization, Increased Surveillance, and Attack and attacks on diversity, neoliberalism and the transformation of teacher education in the U.S., which is in the International Journal of Teaching and Teacher Education in 2010. Uh, join me, please, in welcoming uh, Dr. Ken Zeichner. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. What uh, I'm going to talk about tonight um, is uh, are some of the challenges for teacher university teacher education in particular uh, from a national perspective and what I see as uh, promising practices and I want to underline that what I'm going to talk about are things that I struggle with on a daily basis I still am a director of uh, our elementary and uh, secondary teacher education programs and um, so the things that uh, I'm going to be talking about, and it's not a laundry list of all these different practices. It's uh, what I'm trying to do is to uh, help support a fundamental shift in how university teacher education takes place. Uh, not just because there are a lot of people out there who want us to go away, but because I think it's the right thing to do. And as I began thinking about my career, which is about 38 years now as a university teacher educator, these are the same things that I've been working on and fighting for for my whole career, even before the uh, reformers came upon the scene uh, to try to uh, take us away. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just to talk a little bit about the context. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth, but I want to focus then on um, the direction I think university teacher education needs to go and why. So in the current context, uh, there's, there are essentially um, three camps from my perspective. Um, university teacher education, um, for most of the history of the United States, there have been multiple pathways into teaching, including uh, university teacher education, including uh, teachers' colleges, normal schools before that. And it was only very briefly between 1960 and 1990 that universities and colleges had a monopoly on teacher education in the United States. Um, so uh, right now, universities prepare about three quarters of uh, teachers in the United States. That varies a lot according to where in the country you're talking about in the state of Texas, for example, uh, non-university providers prep of teachers for the state of Texas. Uh, it's almost 50% uh, of the teachers in Texas enter through non-university routes, New Jersey, Florida, um, and to some extent California or other states where the non-university preparation is uh, growing substantially. Washington has just opened the gates a year ago in order to compete for the Race to the Top grant, which we didn't get. But one of the conditions was to open your doors to non-university providers. So we have a lot of programs operating in the state now that weren't here before, um, such as the New York Times has a teacher education program that it runs in conjunction with Rio Salado Community College in New Mexico, and it operates in the state of Washington, along with many other programs. So one position here in this debate that's going on about the future of teaching and teacher education is to defend university teacher education, that 
you know, a lot of university teacher educators around the country saying, um, we're doing a good job, um, and why are they criticizing us? Um, they're going to go away, just like all the critics have gone away before. Um, and uh, uh, that's one position. There's a growing, growing um, effort by people who have called themselves reformers, people coming from outside the field into teacher education um, who want to do away with us, basically to reduce the role of university teacher education to a uh, very minimal role. Rick Hess has written extensively about both public schools being operated by uh, private companies and they're still public schools if they're serving the interest of the public. And it's the same idea for university teacher education. We should, uh, we can be involved, but we'll be involved at the will of others who are actually running the programs. And the Boston Teacher Residency is a good example of that. It's situated in a local ed fund. It has a partnership, um, at least on the surface, with University of Massachusetts Boston and university faculty from a variety of institutions are hired to teach courses that are, and the UMass Boston gives the uh, Boston Teacher Residency, you know, full um, permission to develop the courses and hire people to teach them. So the university role is basically to just provide the degree. It's not, it's not a partnership in the full sense. So that's the example of the kind of thing um, that we're moving toward. Um, even though that I've been um, a critic of traditional university teacher education for many, many years, and even though I've been in an ed school directing teacher education for most of my career, I've also been a critic of some uh, aspects of the traditional model, the reformers consider me uh, a defender of the system. And that's because I don't want to blow it up and do away with it and replace it with something else. Um, and I really uh, think personally that there are, is a third position, which is actually to work toward significant changes uh, addressing the weaknesses of uh, university teacher education. I'm going to talk about some of those in a minute. Um, and to change it in significant ways, but not to do away with it for a number of reasons. One of which is we have approximately 3.6 million teachers in the United States, and there's no way that I can imagine uh, having a system to prepare teachers uh, for this nation without significant involvement of universities in teacher preparation. And so even with everything that's gone on in the last few years, we still prepare about two-thirds of the teachers in, of the United States according to the, both the Department of Education and a recent National Research Council report on teacher education. So um, what I'm going to talk about is a way to transform university teacher education, not reform it, because the reformers, and that's what they call themselves, literally the language has been used uh, to blow up ed schools. Uh, Reed Lyon, who was formerly in the National Institute for uh, Mental Health in Washington, involved with a lot of the reading, um, the science of reading that we now hear a lot about, um, actually said, he later apologized for saying that the best thing that could happen to American public education is that uh, they drop a bomb on education schools. Um, and so this, this um, and the other thing I want to say about the reformers, and I'm not going to go into it in, in a lot of detail here, but there's a substantial role for venture philanthropy in bankrolling an agenda that is deliberately aimed to reduce the uh, significance of education schools in the preparation of teachers in the United States. Um, next week, for instance, there is a summit, the 2012 summit of the New Schools Venture Fund, which if you haven't heard for it, you should uh, heard of it, you should look it up and, and look at the agenda for that event. Uh, because the, a lot of the players, Teach for America, New Teacher Project, uh, Relay Graduate School of Education, the programs that are on their way, uh, even to Washington very soon, um, are, are meeting next week in California, and uh, every funder who's giving money to education will be there. There's very little venture philanthropy and foundation money going into university teacher education right now uh, at all. 
and, and, and that's been documented. And, and if you're interested in details of that, I'll be able, you know, to supply you with references where you can read about it. The, the uh, foundation community, in a lot, and even the foundations like the Ford Foundation, Carnegie Foundation that funded Teachers for a New Era, that my university uh, was part of, uh, five million dollars. Uh, um, they're not funding university teacher education. So this um, is literally an assault on university teacher education. And so there is a deliberate move to close university programs and replace them with something else for a number of reasons that I'm going to talk about. Um, preparation should be shorter. Uh, I think uh, Dean Rios alluded to this real debate over is teaching a profession or is it something that uh, is a technical activity uh, to prepare people to implement teaching scripts? Um, and, and so that's a serious, and so there are a lot of efforts to uh, increase the number of programs where people essentially have a brief period before they become responsible for a classroom and they do most of the learning on the job as full-time uh, teachers uh, legally responsible for classrooms. Uh, Value-added assessment which is uh, report cards on teacher education programs based on the test scores of the students taught by graduates from different programs is rolling in. It's the main element of Secretary Duncan's accountability proposal for teacher education. State of Washington has adopted it and will be rolling it in along with the teacher performance assessment. The value added assessment is the equivalent of holding business schools accountable for the state of the U.S. economy or medical schools accountable for the state of uh, the health care system in the United States. Um, but it's coming, even though there's a substantial debate among experts on assessment about whether it actually gets it quality or helps improve anything. Um, the narrative is underlying all this that public schools are broken. It's the fault of um, um, teachers, bad teachers, so we need to fire bad teachers and so we develop these new evaluation systems. Uh, and it's the fault of teacher education programs largely, largely in universities who prepare these bad teachers. And so the, where the uh, uh, teachers, teachers unions, uh, and now education schools have been targeted in, in various ways. Um, there is an overwhelming evidence from my perspective that poverty in all its aspects, access to health care, access to housing, nutritious food, high quality early childhood education, to a community free of violence, and, and a safe community, all this matters. There was just a new book that uh, was released by the Spencer Foundation uh, uh, called Withering Opportunity that's a summary of research from a number of disciplines about all the evidence about the effects on outside of school factors on the quality of learning. And there are problems in, in schools. There are kids being underserved in public education in the United States, but it's being uh, blamed on teachers and now education schools and everything else um, is being ignored. The other, another part of this is um, that there are many advocates for these uh, fast track prepared teachers called early entry teachers uh, to come into schools. Um, some of the, many of them charter schools or turnaround schools as they're called in Chicago. Um, and, um, to be trained as teachers, not educated. The reformers often use the language of training. In fact, almost always. I met with the director of turnaround schools in Chicago today at my dean's request, and that was for an hour and a half. And he, he, he never, he always used the word teacher training, never once referred to teacher education. Um, and, uh, and so we have this growing inequitable distribution of teachers in the United States that's been documented by people from all sides of the political spectrum on this debate. Um, that uh, we have more and more of these early entry, fast track prepared teacher technicians being, they're teaching almost exclusively in high poverty urban and rural schools. Um, they're not teaching the, chil the children of the people advocating these policies, the children in the middle class, 
uh, and, and there are documented changes about what's happening to the curriculum in the schools where these teachers are working so that the uh, pressures of no child left behind and the, the focus on uh, raising test scores with the punitive consequences for schools means that kids have access to different qualities of ed education. Some, some kids have access to uh, reading and math, skill preparation, and uh, test preparation for the tests, and other schools have access to art and music and science and social studies and other things, and so there's a growing disparity in the quality of education. There are a growing number of communities as these early entry programs like Teach for America grow that do not have access to experienced teachers. What they have are teachers who come in from a variety of programs, New Teacher Project is another one, teach for a few years before they go on to something else, um, such as uh, graduate school in business or law uh, or uh, graduate schools of education. Um, um, or companies like Goldman Sachs and uh, GE that have partnerships with uh, Teach for America. So we have this, uh, uh, this idea that um, uh, it's okay for these schools in poor communities to be staffed by these largely underprepared teachers who teach, learn to teach mostly on the job, stay for a few years and leave, um, but an unwillingness to have those teachers teach our own children. And, and it's a serious inequity in um, distribution. But we're also told at the same time, experience doesn't matter. Well, if it doesn't matter so much, why don't you have your own children being taught by these teach for a while teachers? Um, and uh, we're told even that master's degrees don't matter. I mean, that's a hot issue in the state of Washington. Master's degrees don't matter. We don't need to give teachers bumps in pay for master's degrees based on studies that look at master's degrees in general without addressing the specific nature or quality of the master's degree. But um, things are being published, master's, and people pointing to this so-called research to showing that master's degrees don't matter. Um, and so it really is a situation that um, is very serious. I'm not going to elaborate a lot of it today. I suggest you go to the New Schools Venture Fund as I said before, their website and look at the agenda for the 2012 summit, which includes uh, an hour, a uh, half an hour of stand up comedy by Rick Hess, who's the leading education scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, one of the leading think tanks that is uh, promoting this agenda. Um, and um, the, the amount of money going in, there's an act coming out of Congress that was brought to Congress by the New Schools Venture Fund and some other venture philanthropists called the GREAT Act. How many people have heard of that? So one hand go up, I think. The GREAT Act will authorize charter teacher and, pre and principal preparation programs and it will be rolled out up by the Department of Education in a race to the top competition where they will come to states and say, uh, we have a lot of money for you and you can have it if you let these programs operate in your state. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of one of those programs. And they won't be subject to state regulations as we are. We already have programs in the state that are based out of state, like University of Phoenix and Grand Canyon State, that operate in our state, teaching Washington residents who teach in Washington schools, and they're not subject to the same I, from my perspective, fairly rigorous state requirements for teachers in the state of Washington, which includes cultural competence standards uh, uh, and um, also the teacher performance assessment. Um, and so we, we, have, we already have a two-tiered system here. It's, it's, it's uh, been prevalent in a number of other states uh, for a number of years now. Um, and so I'm going to just move away from the context right now and talk more about where I think we need to go. And not just because of this, but uh, unless we make some significant changes, we're going to be um, uh, greatly reduced in our presence in teacher education within the next few years. There's no doubt about it um, from my perspective. Um, um, okay, transforming teacher education. So I'm not talking about reform, blowing it up, starting over, replacing it 
with charter programs or uh, venture, ramp of, you know, entrepreneurs is a term that's used. Educational entrepreneurs. New Schools Venture Fund prepares a lot of them. And the idea is that you get a bunch of smart people in a room and they uh, ignore everything that's ever been learned by anybody in the field for the last hundred years and they go in there and they invent something. Um, a teacher education program that's innovative. And I'll give you an example in a few minutes. Just like you know, uh, smart people went in a room and inv in invented Google uh, and, and Facebook and so on. It's the same kind of um, um, mentality. Smart people in a room can create it. The folks who have been around have had their chance and they failed. That's us. Uh, and we need to go away. But I think we, uh, there are ways to, uh, uh, that we can change that will keep us around. And the basic idea here is um, whose knowledge should count in the preparation of teachers? Whose responsibility is it to prepare teachers? And, I'm, I, and what I'm trying to work on in my own situation and trying to call for in other university programs is a real shift. I call it an epistemological shift because it changes the nature of whose knowledge counts in teacher education. Um, and I'm going to elaborate that in a little. The other, another piece of it is um, that we can't expect teacher education of any kind in and of itself and by itself to really help deal with the problems that exist in public education that are uh, in part a reflection of the growing inequalities in income in the society. We can't look at it in isolation, but um, we really need to connect teacher education with social justice work going on in communities and in, uh, by the people who live there community activism that exists all in, in urban and rural communities and with various efforts in healthcare, social work, parenting, early childhood, and so on. And I'm going to give you uh, some examples of that. It's also not just a matter of things that we do in our programs, the existing, within existing structures, but I also believe that we need to create new structures, new places for teacher education to be situated that we are a part of. I'm going to talk about that um, in a minute. So basically, um, I'm looking for what I call more democratic epistemology that includes greater respect for and interaction among academic knowledge, knowledge at the university, not just in the education school, but uh, the arts and sciences are a strong part of teacher education, school expertise, um, and, and expertise that exists in communities. I'm going to give you some examples of um, exactly what I'm talking about, including the people who send their kids to public schools and live in communities. I, I believe very strongly that, in my case, urban teachers really need to have access to that expertise from all three of those domains in ways that have not existed commonly before. And that's what um, we're struggling with. So there are basically, from my perspective, only two kinds of teacher education programs in the United States even though there are hundreds of different structural models, four-year, five-year, post-baccalaureate, residency programs, and so on. Um, but it all boils down to, I think, two kinds. Uh, the college recommending program is the sort of traditional program, and what defines it is that the preparation is completed before the teacher becomes the teacher of record. Okay, so it could be um, uh, they're undergraduate or graduate or what, but they finish, the, they're certified, and then they take over a classroom. And the way this, that uh, this has existed is that traditionally that the university has the theory, the university has the expertise. It's our job to give them the theory and expertise, and it's the job of the school to provide a place for them to apply the expertise. And so Jean Clendenin um, in uh, um, Alberta, Canada, has uh, called this the sacred theory to practice story. Um, so it, it, it's a model that for as long as I've been involved in teacher education and many years before, there's been um, recognition that this model really doesn't work very well. Um, that there's a real disconnect between uh, school experience and coursework that exists. Another characteristic of this model is that there's usually very little, commonly very little, 
recognition or a place for community expertise, uh, non-professional people who live and work in the communities, in the education of teachers for those communities. Um, some of the problems with the traditional university model, which is within this college recommending, is doc fragmented programs that are collections of courses that aren't necessarily tied together. Uh, particularly in research universities where the status of uh, teacher education is very low. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, Alan Tom, who used to work at the University of North Carolina and other places, used to refer to teacher education as uh, financial aid for doctoral students that will support their graduate studies. Uh, Dan Liston, a colleague of mine, uh, University of Colorado, refers to it as the housework of uh, teacher education and research universities, this sort of work. And Linda Darling-Hammond has spoken frequently about teacher education as a cash cow that generates income that is then funneled off into other parts of the university. Now, I think the research universities, like the ones I've spent my career in, are most guilty of, of, of these problems. Um, but um, I think to some extent, um, Teacher educate the status of teacher education is an issue um, at more than just uh, research universities. Um, and then because of this sort of, we have the theory, and then you go out and apply it, model of teacher education, there's been this a problem with teacher candidates actually learning how to enact practices in the settings in which they're expected to go and teach. So they, they learn about things, they might uh, see videotapes of things, they may talk to teachers who do certain things that are focused on in the courses, but they don't necessarily have the kind of intense laser-like focus in the clinical training that helps them acquire the uh, expertise in actually enacting practices in the kinds of complex and uncertain settings and underfunded settings that they're going to have to go into and engage in those practices. Clinical teacher education which is now the center of activity in the United States. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Panel from NCAID said teacher education needs to be turned upside down and the clinical part needs to be uh, the center of teacher education. Um, I, it, it's traditionally been low status where student teachers are sent out to schools and, and there's oftentimes not a curriculum and somebody's sent out periodically to observe them but um, it's pretty variable in terms of the quality of the supervision, in terms of whether they have opportunities to actually uh, practice the kinds of things they're learning about in the courses. The cooperating teachers oftentimes don't know very much about what's going on in the university part of the program. The cooperating teachers are doing this extremely important role uh, in mentoring these teacher candidates in addition to teaching full time and being paid at an hourly rate less than you would make at McDonald's for all of this work. And so we've set up a system that really makes no sense. Um, a system, if you look at other countries, uh, there are other examples of countries that have actually invested substantially in uh, very uh, carefully done clinical um, teacher education where the people who do the important mentoring work are uh, actually prepared, supported, and, and rewarded. Um, for the work that they do. Um, there's also a critique that we in universities have not contributed to uh, increasing the diverse, racial and ethnic diversity of the teaching force in the United States, which is very important. There's growing evidence that this is important for all children, but particularly for students of color in terms of Jackie Irvine and Ana Marie Viegas recently did a review of all the research and there's uh, 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 empirical research about the uh, quality of learning, uh, but there are other benefits for students of color, but there are also benefits for all students to have a, a teaching force that's representative of the diversity in the population in the schools. And uh, universities traditionally um, have uh, not helped. And that's one of the reasons there was movement by some to alternative certification programs beginning in the 1980s was the promise that they could bring more teachers of color into the teaching force. Um, then this other um, issue of the perception of us in universities as just, you know, we prepare who we want to prepare according to the people we hired and we don't really uh, really do the preparation in conjunction with what districts actually need in terms of uh, certification areas, in terms of skills. 
Um, and so we'll pair, you know, prepare hundreds of elementary teachers and, you know, there's shortages of special ed teachers. And so one of the things that's happened with these emerging new programs, like the residencies, is that they actually prepare according to, they prepare for particular districts and they prepare in conjunction with those districts to provide the particular kinds of skills that are needed in those districts. Um, and so the university doesn't do this alone. And, um, and that we often have left out the local communities that we're preparing teachers to go to. It's very uncommon, uh, although I, it does exist, for, for teacher candidates to learn how to work with families and communities. That was just highlighted in a recent survey as a weak area, along with other areas. There are always a new survey that comes out every week telling us what we're doing poorly. But this is an area that um, I think has been around for a while. And there are very few programs where teacher candidates actually work in communities um, with uh, children and adults in those communities and learn about those communities. Um, then there are the uh, early entry programs. These are the fast tracks where the, lear the learning to teach takes place mostly on the job as a teacher of record. And so there's like a little preparation beforehand, boot camp, six weeks in Teach for America, the, the uh, new teacher project has a short period. There are a lot of these programs. Uh, Teach for America is the largest and most, uh, the wealthiest. They've raised $300 million uh, over the last 10 years from foundations and the federal government. Um, and so these programs uh, privilege school knowledge and try to reduce the university contribution. In, in preparation. So they will go in and a lot of the program is mentoring on the job uh, in the context of a particular school and things like social foundations of education, which I think are central to the preparation of the kind of teachers I want to prepare are considered non-essential. Multicultural education is another one uh, from the perspective of a number of the reformers. You don't need to have culturally competent teachers. You need teachers who can uh, implement high leverage teaching practices or the scripts that we give them when we send them out. Um, and so, uh, but these programs also, very interesting, they have no or little relationship with the community. I asked the director of the turnaround school program in Chicago today how they work with the local communities. And I was in Chicago in December. They just announced 21 new turnaround schools. There was a riot literally at the board meeting. The police came in, moved all the parents out who were upset that all the teachers in their schools were being fired. Uh, and um, they put the board meeting into closed session. And so um, they basically uh, have no role in these early entry programs. Um, Teach for America doesn't either. So, um, and I'm going to give you some examples of what we're trying to do to engage our local communities in our program as examples, but there are other programs around the country. Um, and so the idea is they come in and they take over these schools and they raise achievement scores, but the people who live in those communities aren't to have a role in that. Um, the, the, the school district, the former school district where I did my um, elementary, middle school, and high school work, uh, as a student, Philadelphia Public Schools is no longer. This week it was dissolved. And the recovery director, it's no longer a superintendent, it's a recovery director. They're bringing in the uh, companies to run the schools in Philadelphia. They're closing 64 schools, firing hundreds of teachers, um, and so on. That's happening in New York. It's happening in Chicago. This is the model at the K-12 level. Uh, there's very little role for local communities in all of this. I showed a film to my class on Thursday night. Um, it's a course on uh, international perspectives on teaching and teacher education. So I, I showed them a film made by New York City teachers uh, called The Inconvenient Truth About Waiting for Superman, which I highly, if you've seen Waiting for Superman, you need to see this one as well, that was made by parents and teachers in New York about and, and it starts out with all these people out in the streets, in school board meetings, uh, just protesting, including the students, about their schools being shut down, co-occupied, they have to co-occupy with the charter schools and they lose space 
and their class sizes go up and the charter schools don't have to take special education students or ELL students. And so these parents are angry and there's really no role. In fact, I asked my class to think about next week, what, what's the role? It's because we just read a book, a new book by Andy Hargraves and Michael Film Fullen that talks about a class between a business culture and a professional culture. And, the, and in the book, they call for the development of professional culture in teaching, making teaching a profession, to be you know, brief about it. And I'm saying it's not just professional in business. They're actually people in communities that need to be somehow a part of this. And uh, neither in early entry or college recommending has that been um, really prevalent. And so very brief preparation before taking over a classroom. Um, one of the things that well, I've read the research on, on these different pathways. Does it make a difference how somebody goes into teaching? And it's really very complicated, but despite what TFA says about their ability to, uh, and in some cases they actually, TFA teachers can raise test scores more than the non-TFA teachers in some cases. In other cases, it's uh, the opposite. Um, it's really very um, uh, complicated. There are no clear conclusions you can draw from the research. A lot of the research is poorly done. One of the things you can see, though, is evidence of a learning curve for these teach for a while teachers, um, where um, if you go in with five or six weeks of training, by the end of the two years, you're going to catch up to where somebody in a well done uh, university program goes in at the beginning. And so there is this learning curve. And again, it's on other people's children that they're learning, uh, not the children of the uh, people advocating these policies. Um, and, and there's a lot of evidence that the, prep, the nature of the preparation in these emerging programs, the early entry programs, is very technically uh, focused and ignores many aspects of preparing uh, professional teachers. I have a student, one of my remaining doctoral students at Madison is uh, defending her dissertation in two weeks where she looked at a particular, I'll leave it unnamed, uh, program in Chicago uh, that's based almost entirely on Lamov's 49 strategies to teach like a champion, which there's nothing wrong with teaching candidates how to use, you know, to manage a classroom but basically, this is the curriculum in a number of these programs. In fact, I, she just sent me an article about all the money that's being made by John Wiley off of this book, Teaching Like a Champion. And now there's like a workbook that goes with it and DVDs. And it's, you know, it's become, with very little empirical evidence, it's become the curriculum in a number of these programs, including Relay Graduate School of Education, which I've mentioned twice now, and I'm going to... Um, ask you uh, later on, we don't have time tonight, to look at something that will uh, be the clearest example of what I'm talking about is on its way here. Um, and I think I would encourage you to watch this uh, 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 description of Relay and uh, decide uh, if that's what you want. Um, and again, these early entry, technically trained, in many cases, teachers, are teaching in poor communities exclusively, providing you know, the growing divide in access to uh, um, high quality education and fully prepared teachers. So what I am envisioning and trying to work on is a new space. I call it democratic space because it uh, accesses knowledge in different ways, from communities, from schools, and universities. Um, where, and um, um, the expertise is not, remember the other, the community was out on the side and in the other one the school was on top or the university was on top. In this way, we, it, it's a hybrid space where we try to bring together the knowledge in different ways. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And this is just an, uh, an acknowledgement that that model of bringing together those three domains of expertise is a simplification, oversimplification. Um, my wife, Andrea, who's a designer who designed those bubbles uh, on those three slides, I have to get her actually to help me think about how to reflect more of the actual complexity of it. Examples being teacher candidates come to teacher education programs with uh, uh, knowledge, uh, cultural resources, 
and all sorts of things that should be accessed in the program. The students they teach have a role to play in their education as teachers. For example, our uh, secondary teacher ed students in the first quarter of their program um, meet with high school students who talk to them about what they like and don't like about teachers. And um, uh, there's a lot of issues that have, of race that are addressed in those sessions. Uh, they have a role to play. And there's a whole evidence, uh, history of research documenting that, you know, um, there are all these factors outside of the program. They're going to shape, help shape how somebody learns how to teach. Teacher candidates read the newspaper. They watch TV. They watch movies. They read the blogs. Um, and so there are all these things. And we're not the only influence. Um, uh, in fact, there's a lot of other stuff that is, is pretty powerful. And we have different policy contexts. And it does matter what policy. You know, this, is, this is very different than Texas, for example in terms of the uh, policy context. So it is more complicated. So what are some examples? What does this actually mean in terms of uh, practices? Um, OK, so one of the things we're working on, and I emphasize working on in uh, Seattle, are moving methods courses into schools where faculty uh, work alongside teachers, some of whom are our graduates, teaching courses, methods courses, uh, in those classrooms, in the partner schools. Um, and um, we have this in elementary literacy and math. In secondary, it exists to some degree in all of our secondary programs. We have uh, um, language arts, methods class this quarter. In secondary, language arts being taught entirely in Aki Kurosi Middle School in South Seattle which has about a 98% poverty rate. And there are three teachers who are working in this course. We have the uh, foundations course, working in schools that's taught in Franklin High School in Rainier Valley. Um, and so we, we have uh, tried to strategically and deliberately access things that teachers know and to put that alongside things that faculty know. And uh, there are, uh, it's very hard work. It's a lot more work for the faculty who, are, who go out into schools and, and, and uh, just the collaboration meetings with the teachers, working everything out collaboratively and the logistical issues in the schools. And uh, we have to pay the teachers, of course, for their involvement in this. Um, and that's my Boeing chair funds a lot of this work because the institution doesn't. There's no provision for that. Um, but we're, we're trying to invent new ways to teach these methods courses where um, the candidates get an opportunity to actually see some of the practices, to uh, rehearse them, uh, to um, um, get intense feedback, to go back in. That we have, if you go into one of these methods courses, our math methods, Elham Kazemi's course, for instance, you'll see uh, candidates going through these cycles where they're focusing on acquiring expertise in the enactment of particular teaching strategies to teach mathematics. And they, they video, they have these flip cams, and they're videoing everything, and they're analyzing it. Uh, it's, it's very uh, highly focused, laser-like focus on enactment. And the teacher plays a very active role along with uh, the faculty member. Uh, so that's one piece of it, the methods work. We have foundations courses, including social foundations courses that are taught to both our elementary and secondary uh, students on site. Every summer, for instance, the elementary program, uh, we have, they start out the program in, uh, at Concord Elementary in uh, Beacon Hill in Seattle in a bilingual program uh, where the courses are all offered on site uh, that first quarter in the program. The Social Foundations course, which is uh, developed and taught by a doctoral student, Michael Bowman, um, focuses on it's, uh, the issues that you would teach in a school and society course, but in the context of that particular place that particular neighborhood, that particular community, in terms of the history of uh, education and, and uh, racial segregation and integration in Seattle. Really helping those student teachers, the teacher candidates, really learn about where they are historically, politically, socially, culturally, uh, in ways that they, they respond very uh, positively, because they see the relevance of that understanding and analysis to them becoming better teachers. 
uh, in the many years I was at uh, Wisconsin, the students would love the school and society courses, but they didn't connect those courses to the process of becoming a teacher. So th th this sort of putting social foundations in the context and really focusing on the place has become very powerful. And one of the things that Michael does during the summer is to bring in parents who send their kids to that bilingual program. And they talk with the teacher candidates who are brand new to the program about their own experiences in schools. They talk with them about their uh, perceptions of an experience with the school that their kids are in during the year. And it really jolts the teacher candidates. And they're beginning to see another perspective on the school from outside of what they would hear from the university, what they would hear from the teachers in a way that's very powerful. And we do that in our secondary program as well. We also have all of our elementary and secondary students working in community field experiences uh, to varying degrees. We're trying to build it through both our elementary and secondary programs. It's sometimes service learning, but not always. We want them to see kids learning inside and outside of school. We want them to learn about the assets in the communities that they're working in. We use Peter Morell's notion of community teacher. The, you know, a teacher is doing work for the communities that she's working in um, and that uh, they really need to access um, uh, the expertise and knowledge and to be able to be a good teacher in a community. It was something that was always important to me as a white teacher working in a predominantly African-American community in New York uh, to uh, really have that connection to the community. It was a central part of my colleague Gloria Latson Billings' work, the Dream Keepers, when she studied both teachers of color and non-teachers of color, successful teachers who work with African-American students, that connection to the community and knowledge of the community. Commitment to the community is central and something we're trying to really focus on. I had a project for about uh, five years the National Center for Research on Teacher Learning, where I studied programs that really focused on community immersion. Um, and it, 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 I think a very central component of the preparation of, of urban teachers, but not only urban. Some of the research that I did focused on rural areas up in Alaska and the Navajo Reservation and, the, and, and community people who were non-credentialed as teachers played a very important role in educating those teachers to teach uh, their children. And so uh, these uh, courses are, uh, we're working on them. Uh, it's been very difficult to uh, uh, keep things going with a, you know, since 2009, we lost 50% of our state support. The University of Washington has had huge effects. So while we're cutting big time, you know, we're trying to increase uh, the expense on teach this is more expensive to do this way. When you bring in parents, you bring in teachers um, and involve them in ways um, that are different than before. It, um, other things that are part of this is, you know, part of this taking clinical teacher education seriously. That's another thing we've been working on. So really thinking hard about what work in the teacher education program that does go on out in schools and communities and really <clears throat> thinking it through and, and constantly monitoring it closely as we would our own university courses. And, and again, traditionally in universities, they're just sort of sent out there. A lot of, in a lot of places, people who uh, say retired teachers or adjuncts are hired to do the field supervision that aren't connected to the rest of the program, have no power to make decisions in the rest of the program, and there's this sort of two worlds in a teacher education program. And so, and this kind of change, we've had a lot in my career, all these things come along. Uh, one of the recent ones was professional development schools. Um, now we have residencies, and I'm going to say a word about that. And so everybody, you know, gets money to do a professional development school or residency, and not things don't necessarily change. There have been a lot of slogans in teacher education. I'm really trying to achieve, when I'm talking about epistemological shifts, some really uh, substantial changes in how we interact with people in schools and in communities and that we share responsibility in, in, in ways that we're, none of us are really used to. Um, and so these are some of the processes that we're um, working on. Um, there's also 
the most currently popular model in the United States right now for the Obama administration for sure is the teacher residency, the urban teacher residency, which again is to prepare teachers for specific contexts. It's a more school-based program. Um, it's, it's a program where the teachers during the residency year or two years are mentored, so it's not an early entry program. It's sort of in between. You have your traditional university program that's very disconnected oftentimes from practice in communities, and then you have your early entry program that sort of throws them in and they learn on the job. The residency is in between. It's more school-based, but there's also uh, coursework. Um, and so uh, in studying these programs, um, and in part I'm studying it because I've been involved in helping to raise money to develop one in Seattle, which we're going to be doing over the next year, um, that there's a whole lot of things going on. We've, this new structure has been created, but then when I look, and I call it ecologies of expertise, the uh, expertise of universities, schools, and communities operates in all kinds of ways within residencies. There's some folks doing residencies, as I want to do, to try, because I think it offers potential to realize the kind of hybridity, the kind of uh, um, dem more democratic knowledge interaction that, I, that I'm trying to achieve in, in my work, that creating our residency will exist in a neutral space outside of the university and outside of the school. But the university and the schools will be involved, the Seattle district will be involved. But it's outside of the bureaucracy and outside of the uh, budget cuts uh, to both the schools and the universities. There are folks involved in residencies because they see it as a way to push universities out. Uh, another strategy in addition to the early entry program. So Boston, as I mentioned before, there's really no university involvement. And there's some other residencies on the list at uh, the New Schools Venture Fund Summit next year. You'll, be, you'll see a lot of residencies at this reform uh, event next week in California. And so you, re and then there are people doing residencies because there's a lot of money being thrown at residencies now, and so they're doing it. Um, and in some cases, they're doing what they were doing, but calling it a residency, which was the history of uh, professional development schools, the history of reflective teaching, and, and a whole lot of other things in uh, teacher education. And there's almost no evidence, it's very interesting that there's so much money, millions of dollars and hundreds of residencies popping up all over the country, there's almost no empirical evidence about their efficacy. There's some evidence, limited, that it, they, recruit, they increase teacher retention in urban schools. Um, and th there's uh, almost no evidence. There's one study that came out on Boston teacher residency a few months ago that looked at the effect of the residency on student achievement using a value-added model, and it was mixed results. So there's not a lot of overwhelming support. Of course, we're being asked to prove that what we do actually works, but that doesn't seem, I'm, I'm, it's almost to me as if uh, truth doesn't matter anymore. Uh, you know, you can call something anything, you know, uh, Michelle Rees group, uh, Students First, or Stand for Children, which is really Stand for Corporations, and it doesn't matter. And so we're being pressured to, to you know, where's the evidence that what you do in universities work and residencies um, uh, don't have to prove that. But I'm still very, I'm excited to be, you know, involved in this effort, but I'm also very frightened because it's a very slippery slope, um, the residency uh, model. But I think it does offer the potential, um, and I do believe there are advantages to going outside of the formal university and school structure to do this kind of shared responsibility uh, model. And so um, we have some research underway on the work we're doing on uh, uh, hybrid teacher education. Uh, right now, we're focusing on the methods courses that we're moving out to schools and we're looking at um, how does doing this work alongside teachers actually change the way these courses are taught. And it really does. You know, you talk to any of our faculty who have been teaching uh, out in the schools with teachers, and in some cases in literacy and math and elementary, it's the whole course is taught out at the schools. Um, they uh, cover less material, for example, and they're focusing more on these cycles of implementation and analysis and really focusing on enactment, uh, acquiring ability to enact practices. Um, 
and uh, we're looking at um, the community experiences as well. And we're looking at how does this affect the teacher candidate learning, uh, how, you know, doing this kind of work. Do they really acquire the ability to enact practices better than they did before? And uh, can they then transfer that to, because they also have placements in addition to the school, school classrooms where they're uh, actually having their courses. And so a lot of this research is, uh, you know, we don't have a lot that we can show for it now, but we're, um, um, and then we're doing research on what does it take to do this work. And so we're looking at um, um, uh, the resources that are needed. Uh, I'm interested in trying to create something that is um, manageable and sustainable, even in the budget environment that we're in. Uh, part of that, you know, I came into the University of Washington just as the money had run out uh, from their Teachers for a New Era project and all these things had been created and it was my job to, you know, implement them or get rid of them because there was no money left. And then the budget cut started. So I want to try to figure out, and one of the ways uh, is this uh, working with schools and, universe and communities in different ways that I think will be helpful. And so I want to just uh, quickly talking about what this work is not. Um, it's not um, a, romantic, a romanticization that we can eliminate power differentials. I'm talking about trying to level things a bit. There's different power, there's different expertise. We all bring different things to the table uh, when we work with uh, communities and schools in these ways, but we're not making everybody equal. We're not going to suddenly uh, agree about everything. And I've learned this in the two years that I've been in meetings with our community and school partners in conceptualizing the beginning of this residency. Uh, we still have a disagreements about what, is the, what are the goals, what kind of teachers do we want to prepare, what kind of teacher education does it take. Um, and aiming for consensus, I think, is a mistake. Um, and so I don't claim to be trying to do that, that suddenly all the differences are going to go away and everybody's going to love one another and get along. Um, I also strongly believe, looking back on the history of teacher education, that merely moving teacher education to schools and communities doesn't necessarily change anything. Because, you know, there are a lot of people across the country and a lot of stuff coming out in the literature of moving schools, uh, courses into schools and communities. But it's not, they're not clear oftentimes about what they're doing or why they're doing it and what consequences it has. And it's become, to some extent, a fad. I'm talking about what we're trying to do is some real shifts in uh, the issue of whose knowledge counts. And so what I am aiming for in this work, um, and I'm not doing it alone, I'm you know, trying to support it and lead it in various ways, is a greater inclusivity of voices and perspectives in the teacher education program as we run it and renew it on an ongoing basis. It's when you bring people together and you're really working on leveling things a bit because you really um, provide a space where people uh, create something in a new way, where the expertise that they have, the perspective they have, the needs that they have become part of it. It's not just driven by the university. Um, and that there's mutual respect, even though we disagree, there's mutual respect for one another and our different points of view. And what we try to reach is what I call reasonable agreements, not consensus, but reasonable agreements. Where can we find common ground, even though we disagree, even about the goals and about the strategies? Where can we find common ground and move ahead? There's a lot of polarization going on right now, people yelling and shouting at one another. Um, and that we're losing sight of what the goal is which is to address these issues in public education. And I think it's important, uh, and I'm trying very hard to be able to work um, with uh, folks who um, hold very different views from myself, and I'm doing that to some extent within this residency program as it evolves. Uh, tomorrow I'm on a panel at the Gates Law School, which is why I can't be with you tomorrow, um, uh, with a bunch of folks who are reformers. Uh, talking about um, teacher workforce development. Uh, and um, we were told not to yell and scream at each other, but really and it's framed as a Socratic dialogue uh, to try to work together and so talk about how to solve some issues. And uh, it's a challenge, but I think really that's what it has to come to, just as it does in our U.S. Congress. It gets nothing done. 
uh, because it's so polarized, I think. Um, so, merely moving teacher education to schools and communities did not lead to anything different in terms of teacher learning. Doing what I'm talking about is a utopian reality. We're never going to achieve it. We're always aiming for it, never going to reach it. Um, and this is really hard work, really hard work, especially when you're talking about sustaining it. It's really different. It's difficult to learn how to operate in different ways because the, oftentimes the typical partnerships, collaboration, people come in with their own agendas and they lay things side by side. And one of the things the Seattle superintendent said early on in the uh, residency discussion was to us, are you willing to put everything on the table? Everything needs to be up for discussion. And I said, are you willing? Um, and once he said yes, then okay. And so the idea is you put it out there and you begin to move into each other's worlds in ways that you haven't experienced and, and, and get rid of the hidden agendas. You know, if you have a grant and you have something, and this is not the place to stick it in and, and they'll stick their things in. And this is a place to really imagine something uh, together and to create these new uh, kinds of programs that, uh, re that um, respect everybody's expertise and that meet everybody's needs. Everybody should gain from it, including the schools. When we do teacher preparation in public schools, that we should be helping them uh, with their uh, mission of educating students. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's really, really hard work. Um, the other thing I would say is that good teacher education is only part of the solution. Good teacher education for the teachers of everybody's children, I would underline, because we're not doing that now. We have uh, high quality preparation of professional teachers for some people's children and this low level uh, technical preparation for teachers of other people's children. Um, one of the things that I envision, and I keep bringing up, and people keep saying, you know, it's a little strange, but um, is actually trying to deliberately align our teacher education programs with uh, efforts in particular communities to, to uh, achieve greater justice. We have an effort in South King County called Center, uh, uh, Community Center for Education Results which is part of this Promise Neighborhood Initiative around the country. Cincinnati and Syracuse are places where it's uh, very well developed, uh, where you have people in the communities that we're working in who are doing things to better their communities in various ways. We have all kinds of uh, uh, agencies, healthcare, early childhood, uh, housing, nutrition, community gardens, all sorts of things that, um, and so right now this Community Center for Education Results, which works in seven districts in South King County, brings people to the table regularly to examine data. What we need to do and what I'm trying to do is uh, that we need to align our programs with those efforts and look more comprehensively of how the work in teacher education we do is coordinated with all these other things that people are doing with these same families in the communities and to really focus our teacher education programs and I see the residency being focused on uh, feeder schools in particular neighborhoods and that the teacher education is only one small piece of a broader effort to really help turn around um, the rotten outcomes that exist in some of those communities, lack of access to things that um, other communities have access to. Um, one of the things that I think is real important in moving forward in teacher education that I don't see in the reform community, I get to go to a number of meetings with reformers, including the um, people, people who invented Relay, is that there's this real sort of, uh, we know everything, we have these smart people and they're going to create it and we don't need to learn anything that anybody in the field has done or learned in the past. Um, and so I mentioned Relay Graduate School of Education three times now. There's a website called Teaching Works that was created by the dean at the University of Michigan. On that website there are a series of seminars where they bring people in from different parts of the country who have uh, programs. Two of my colleagues came in and spoke about some of the work they're doing, including Elham Kazemi, who teaches our math methods in the field with teachers. Um, Relay, Graduate School of Education. Uh, I encourage you to watch that video. It's an hour and a half. You may need a little support. I had a bottle of wine when I uh, watched it myself. Um, 
And you will see very clearly what I'm talking about with regard, there's this total disregard for learning, building a program, and so I think it's real important, and I think we've been guilty of this as a field in the United States, really not paying enough attention to what it is that's been done in the past and learning from the mistakes of the past. A current example of that is uh, what's called practice-based teacher education, that we focus on a set of practices um, of teaching and that we have a shared understanding of what that is across the country and that we, um, and, and Deborah Ball is I think the most visible advocate of this. And so suddenly practice-based teacher education has become a very hot thing. Everybody wants to do it. Um, it's, you know, it was all over um, the conferences, AACT, AERA, um, and uh, there's a whole history, a long history of efforts in practice-based teacher education, different incarnations of it. It was called competency-based teacher education when I started in the 70s as a teacher educator. We really need to recognize that people have learned things before and that whatever we do when we plan to go forward in teacher education, we need to look at that history and try to learn from it. Um, I started my career as a teacher educator in the National Teacher Corps, which is a federal program that was designed to prepare teachers to work in high poverty urban and rural schools. Um, there was very little written about the teacher corps. This whole idea of community-based learning uh, was a central part of the teacher corps. A number of the folks who uh, are proposing this now um, think it's new. There's not much that's new in teacher education. We're always focusing on creating something new and innovative and then, you know, our, our, our workplaces are set up that we have to, you know, uh, prove ourselves to be innovative and, you know, making unique contributions. But I think, you know, there's a lot to learn from carefully studying those who have gone before us and what they've accomplished, and I think that's very important. Um, I think in this whole debate going on that multiple pathways are here to stay, and I think they should be, that uh, we shouldn't have a monopoly on teacher preparation. I think the focus should be on making whatever pathways exist high quality, holding all of them to the same high standards, and we don't have that now. Um, and I think that non-university folks should be able to prepare teachers um, in, you know, that we don't necessarily have, you know, the answers and that a little, um, the multiple pathways and to some extent this sort of uh, innovation will be stimulated by different opportunities to create things by different folks. Uh, and so I'm not, they shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't go away just like we shouldn't go away. But then they shouldn't be doing these things like preparing these technically trained teachers to teach only certain children. So I'm talking about um, high quality programs and we do know some things about what they are, the characteristics, um, but we're not going to go back to a day that existed from 1960 to 1990 where we've had a monopoly on teacher education. Those 30 years, that's over and um, we're going to go back to what existed for the hundred years before that, which were um, multiple pathways. And this idea of residency, school district-based programs, uh, is not new. If you read Jim Fraser's book on the history of American teacher education, my wife's uh, high school in Philadelphia, Philadelphia High School for Girls, opened as a normal school, I think it was in the 1840s. And, and most urban districts had uh, their own teacher education programs, just like the ones that are springing up now. It's not new. Um, I would also say that this current press toward creating a market, getting rid of us, and just creating, you know, bringing in the venture uh, capitalists to create these programs like Relay, um, that, that, that there's no real evidence that a market-based approach actually raises quality. Um, when you look at countries, as we're often asked to look at these countries that are higher up on the list in these international comparisons, if we were actually doing what these countries are doing, we would not be doing what we're doing in trying to uh, uh, create a market economy in teacher education. We would be strengthening the universities and colleges, but I'm arguing that we need to not just strengthen us in the old disconnected ways, but we need to be more connected and working with people in uh, schools and communities. And we really need to deal, uh, this, this is the thing that really bothers me, is this sort of, uh, there's one kind of teacher and teacher preparation that's okay for some people's children. 
I was once in a debate with somebody from the Bush administration who referred to them as good enough teachers. You know, we shouldn't have, good enough teachers should not be good enough for anyone's children. Everyone's children really deserves a fully prepared professional teacher and a high quality uh, public education, uh, regardless of the pathway. And this two-track system, which is growing wider and wider, is really a fundamental thing that we need to confront and make people aware of. And so we should have the same high expectations for the teachers of all children as we have for the teachers of our own children and grandchildren. Um, not that everybody's child should have what we want for our child, but the same high quality, um, because it's going to affect us all. Education is not just a private good to be consumed by us as individuals, but education is a public good that is fundamental, strong public education to the survival of our society. And so th these are really critical times, and I think uh, that we really need to be open to moving forward and changing to uh, becoming less the experts and offering our expertise in collaboration with others' expertise in different ways. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you.